All right. So uh, you wanted to, I think we should kick off with your tweet, Adam, about well, writing Pearl for money. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, I guess you should so, give context first. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no. Go, well, uh, you dug up this, this um, I, appropriately, you called it the Dykstra tweet storm. What, what year was this tweet storm? Uh, 1975, I believe, um, is when he wrote th- this whole like series of, of, I mean, and people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, but there's whole, there's more context around it. Did you read what the other things that he wrote? I mean, it's like, there's, there's really not more context around it. He's just basically it, lighting everybody yeah. on fire. Yeah, I read that. Four, it was the, like that three, four page document that you posted as well. Yes, that's where he, yeah. he he's just decided that he wants to light everybody up. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see. I, I should, uh, yeah, so he's got, uh, I, I mean, like, he's just saying also things are just like, it just seems mean. You know, PL1 is the fatal disease, belongs more to the problem set than the solution set. Okay, next topic. You're like, that's, come on. That's, that's just, you're just being an asshole. Yeah, yeah. It did, it did seem like he was, I mean, again, per, I, I thought calling it a tweet storm felt perfect. And it felt like maybe I was reading a displaced Paul Graham essay or something like that. Uh, the use of COBOL cripples the mind. Its teaching should therefore be regarded as a criminal offense. It's like, do you mean any of these words? <laughs> it's like that's come on, that's come a, on, a little much. Yeah. That's a little right. much. I mean, it's just like it, it just feels like uh, APL is a mistake carried through to perfection. It is the language of the future for the programming techniques of the past. It creates a new generation of coding bums. Moving right along to the next language. It's like, what do you <laughs> like, dude? But there, there were there were both uh, pieces of his bigotry that I agreed with and and sort of feel bigoted about. Like for example, um, that there are the implication that there are languages that sort of poison the mind, and I don't m- believe that, and yet I think that sometimes. Um, like uh, you know, my my son was learning Python in school, and I think Python's fine or whatever, but. Um, but I worry about him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> uh, that is got such a luxury to be worried about him because he's in like Python, as opposed to like it's two in the morning and I don't know where he is. <laughs> yeah, I hope he's not doing Python with the wrong people. <laughs> That's right. That's um, right. Well, I'm just worried he's going to grow up to believe in significant white space. You know, I'm just. <laughs> That's right. Come on, I can't as a as a parent. It, look, Adam, it is normal for teenagers to experiment with the significance of white space. That's a normal phase. A lot of young, uh, so I don't think you have anything to fear. I think you'll be okay. But, but then, but then, the, you know, I find myself, uh, you know, there, there was a piece in there saying um, basically that languages affect the way you think, and I've certainly found that to be true. You know, when I, I think I, I look at some of our colleagues, their Rust code. You know, it feels very much like uh, like functional programming languages. Yes. I feel like my Rust code, and I'm not proud of this, but like kind of feels like modern Java because that that's what I had been in more recently. Um, and, and and I don't know, like I I think that there some of it's uh, skin deep, but there there are some places where it really changes the way you think about things. Right, and I think and that gets us to kind of like the tweet that got us here. Um, is the, the the tweet that he has around basic? And now, of course, I can't. Uh, where you know, I had it just in front of me. Oh, there we are. It is. Impre- and so the, the tweet that got us here, uh, the tweet in this in this nineteen seventy five tweet storm is: it is practically impossible to teach good programming to students that have had a prior exposure to basic. As potential programmers, they are mentally mutilated beyond hope of regeneration. Uh, it- doesn't really give a lot of room, not a lot of wiggle room in there. Not a lot of wiggle room in there. And it's like, it's like also, the students that have had a prior exposure to BASIC, you don't even have to have written it. Like, if you were, like, in the room with a BASIC manual, we're going to consider that to be exposure. Uh, so, yeah. so maybe that is a good segue into my Pearl experience, because I, I actually sort of, I, I think people feel that way about Pearl, and I'm not sure that they're wrong. Um because I think Pearl is sort of tries to be everything to everyone, at least, you know, Pearl four and five that I learned. Um, so, um, so, well, for, yeah. Adam, first take, you said it, the Pearl was the first code you wrote for money. So take us back to yes. that. Yes. Okay. So 
Uh, the year was like 1996. Ooh, okay. And I went to high school, um, and I was graduating shortly. And I had I, you know, my my Pearl was self taught, and I was like on IRC channels with the the uh, the authors of like the the Camel and the uh, and, and like the llama books and uh, very excited at the time, very excited for Pearl and, and the kind of stuff I could do on the Mac and the alumni, uh, I, yeah, I went to a, a fancy high school. Oh, so Adam, do you want and, to pause just to explain the camel book? Because I feel this is camel with an E by the way. <laughs> oh yeah. Not camel is uh, a no camel, but yeah. 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 So, uh, um, there used to be, we used to kill trees and print words on them. <laughs> no. Um, so like O'Reilly, you know, has all these books with uh like carvings on the cover of different animals and so the different animals would become kind of iconically associated with particular languages and especially like in the in the sort of early and and pre-internet days there were these this trove of information that felt otherwise to me at least completely you know inaccessible absolutely i don't know yeah no no i think absolutely the case that you needed books to be able to learn how to do stuff no question. And, and, and they were sort of like magical. I mean, all, almost like incantations that, that could, that, again, there was no other way to sort of absorb this information, at least not as like a, you know, 11th grader or whatever that was accessible to me. So, um, yeah, I went to a, like a, a, a bougie high school that kept in touch with its alumni and wanted a, a alumni database. And I made a alumni database that like served up web pages with like CGI bin, um, the, the early serverless, if you'll, if you'll allow it. Um, I don't know that I will. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't. How do I disallow it? I, I'm not sure I allow it either. Um, but yeah, it was like it, and it stored it in like the Berkeley database format or something, which is, you know, if you look towards the back of, of the, of the camel book, I'm sure that's where I learned about it. Um, so yeah, I wrote kind of slinging some Pearl on an hourly basis uh, for, for money, but way back when, um, and so, and I had a real fondness and real affinity for Perl as a language, um, although I'm not sure I do anymore. Um, but so at this point, so you're a teenager. You're you're on your your you're a high school yeah. junior or senior or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was I was a junior. Yeah, junior and senior in high school, and then in, into like my freshman year of college because it needed a little I don't know tweaking from time to time. And do you know at this point that your career is software? No, not at all, actually. You know, I, I went to Brown University thinking that I was going to be a math major and sort of took computer science because I was interested in it. I'd taken one computer science class in high school in Pascal, uh, which was fine. I don't know. I, I remember very little of it. Uh, the, the, my, most, my most distinct memory of that course was our teacher explaining that a finite state machine could be in a finite number of states. Like, for example, you could have a soda machine that was in a finite number of states. And I said, you mean like 50? And he left. He left? He left the room. He said he was like... 50 is too so many. Done. No, no, like meaning 50 states of the union. Um, like that it could be in the 50 oh, I, United I States. I, you know, a little slow over here. I got it. Okay. Yeah, well, well... F- <laughs> f- so 50 days, finite yeah. states plus the District of Columbia. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And so he, he walked out at that point. Um, so, yeah. Uh, th- th- I did definitely did not know that like I had a future, you know, writing code for money. But you're writing Perl and you're enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was like solving a problem, and it was like, um, it's like you know, code g- generating web pages. It was neat. And then, uh, are we going to get to a Larry Wall story out of this? Yeah, yeah, Good. yeah. So, um, so then, fast forward probably to like 2005. I was in Amsterdam at the first ever uh, European OSCON. Um, and OSCON is great, great conference. Really enjoyed uh, OSCON that I went to in Portland. Um, OSCON in Europe was like, you know, the, but there are kind of two elements of OSCON that, that worked really well together. There was like the practitioners who were like using open source software uh, in, in, in load bearing fashions. And then there were the folks deep in the community and it was like good listening and hearing. And OSCON Europe that first year was only the latter. Like only, it was like this big self-congratulatory uh, circle something um, where folks in the open source community could, could congratulate themselves without um, any of the pesky like folks in industry 
you know, uh, humbling them in any way. So it was a tough conference. Um, and then I, I will, in full disclosure, also note <laughs> that I gave a talk on D-Trace at that time, attended by a single person oh! who, asked no, who asked no questions and left. So you and uh, I, I, I do not know that you and I have both given a talk to a single person. I, you know, I thought that I had always, I thought I was the only one. Nope, nope. Uh, and, and, and the thing that, and it was up against a Pearl Six talk. Like, so everyone um, at the conference was at the Pearl Six talk or like a poetry jam or something Pearl like that. Six, was... now Raku. Am I remembering that yes, correctly? Yes, I want, yes, I want, right, I want right. to say, my whole brain wants to say Roku every time I think of Pearl Six. That's right. Oh, right. Call back to a, to a previous episode. Um, so, uh, but, I, but I, you know, Larry Wall was there and I grew up really idolizing Larry Wall in a lot of ways. Um, and then, you know, sort of weird coincidence. Um, my, my girlfriend at the time was a, was a high school teacher um, who, um, who was teaching Larry's son. And in this, in this high school that was very small, sort of like this magnet program, there were only about 20 kids. And so I sat down next to Larry Wall and I, I introduced myself and I said, oh, I, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, I, I know this person is your son's teacher. And, and Larry said, well, oh, like, where does she teach? And I thought that was a very strange question because <laughs> uh, I basically just said that she was in, I said where, where she taught. And, and he said, oh, my son goes there. And we went around in that circle two or three times before I excused myself and went to, um, uh, I think it was Alan, it, it was, it was uh, the, the guy from Sun who maintained our Pearl Port. And I said, was Larry Wall just fucking with me? Like, what happened there? And he said, no, that's just what he's like. Um, and so uh, then I sat at lunch by myself and, and thought that maybe I had the wrong heroes growing up. Uh, and this is c coming only a year after we met Dennis Ritchie at a yeah. – you, you can tell Dennis Ritchie's story. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The, the, the late Dennis Ritchie. So we met Dennis Ritchie in 2004 at, um, when we had originally presented D-Trace, and we were very excited – too excited, some would say uh, – to demo – I mean, we did I – did I accost him? Is that – did I – I'm worried – I mean, I feel like I can – so I, I think we all approached him with great enthusiasm. And in retrospect, it may have been mistaken for a mugging. Because I think we definitely got a fight or flight reaction out of him in that. Oh, for sure. And I think, as I recall, I was very, I mean, I don't want to use the word aggressive. I, I, I would like to say enthusiastically, but I think in hindsight, I really have to say aggressively trying to, because I, I was trying to thank him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, here. I mean, just to paint that scene, we've got three twenty-something kernel engineers at Sun. I mean, not not. I mean, you know, hoodlums. But you know, very very excited to like to meet Dennis Ritchie in the flesh. At least, I mean, I, I assume you'd never met him before. No, I never Didn't he no, recognize no. you. No, <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, poor, poor Dennis. You know, he was really painfully shy in general. Well, uh, so, yes. I, I was yeah. I was amazed at how many conferences he actually went to. So yeah, we 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 you know we brought a, a kind of a laptop, almost like sort of presenting him a laptop, saying we wanted to show you Dtrace because it's so inspired by your work. And he said something about needed to catch a train, and like sprinted into the bathroom. Yeah, he he, yeah. and I. I Adam, I don't know if it actually is the case or if it is only in our own retelling that he went into the wrong bathroom. I feel like he went into the right bathroom, but he definitely went into the bathroom. He said, like, I need to, like, I have to catch a train, and he went into the bathroom. And I, we had this idea of, like, should we, like, wait a minute? Should we? <laughs> Maybe? I mean, there's no other exit from here. It's like, that's just, and, and I, we, I remember thinking, like, should we go? Maybe we could, we should, should we follow him into the bathroom? Maybe should we continue this demo in the bathroom? That seems that seems inappropriate. And then we kind of were joking, like maybe we would go in there. And he'd be like standing on the toilet, like waiting for us to leave. It was pretty clear that, like, yeah. So I think, sorry to the late Dennis Ritchie. I'm so sorry that we did. That we, yeah. we had a poor notion of social boundaries. We were just in, yeah. we were enthusiastic. We were just excited. We were, we were excited. excited. But so with Larry, <laughs> you feel that that you were getting. Uh, no, I think I was just getting the earnest reaction, and I think that like I don't I don't think he was messing with me, but I, I do think I did felt like at, at the conference where there was like literally poetry about Pearl, uh, and then this very odd encounter. I just uh, you know it it made me 
feel like again that I maybe had the wrong heroes as a high schooler. Okay, so to, to, in terms of like it, it's kind of turning to our subject at hand, do you yes. feel that what is the role? Because I mean, Dykstra here is implying, and I obviously disagree with him that that you are. Uh, if you've had any exposure to basic, that your mind has been mutilated. But on the other hand, there is probably some truth to learning those early languages do probably inform the way you think. And I would actually, um, the, you know, um, Roger Huey died um, yesterday. Um, and he's a, it was a giant in APL. Um, and I interviewed Arthur Whitney years and years ago, and he knew Roger well and described how uh, the growing up as a Cantonese speaker, uh, Roger would do math in Cantonese in his head because it was tighter, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and, and I mean, I, it, getting to a more positive way of saying the same thing that I guess that Dykstra was saying, that these early languages do inform our thinking and the way we think about things. So what, what was your first language? Brian? So you went pretty far down JavaScript and then came back. How did that change the way you think about writing code? Um, the, oh, the, well, uh, that's a good question. So that was a, a relatively later in life thing, right? So I, uh, my first programming language was basic. I mean, I am of the, of the, of the mutilated minds that Dykes is referring to. Um, I had, I mean, I can still remember, and I, I don't think that I am like unique at all generationally in this. I can remember uh, seminal line numbers in my own programs. So I mean, good old Go Sub One Thousand One, man. I had a lot of. I wrote a some very complicated basic programs, and I do feel that this is where like Dijkstra is not totally wrong. I don't feel that my mind was mutilated, but I do feel that it was a cognitive lift to get to structured programming because I didn't really, basic does, um, I mean, we've, fortunately we've outgrown line numbers. Line numbers are really, are kind of bad news. Because you've ever, have you written much basic, Adam? No, I mean, just, just. Just, just the right you talk about, just go, go to yeah. 10. Yeah, it's yeah. a, complicated programs get really hard. Um, this is not a deep thought. And to the point that I didn't really, um, but it is extremely. You accessible. didn't appreciate that go to could be considered harmful. I did not appreciate the go to. Well, but I, I also feel that like it is very much a consequence of the extremely limited resources on a TRS eighty or on these on these, these on an Apple two E or an Apple one. Um, you had so few resources. I do think would the world have been better if that's all fourth instead of basic. You know, I don't know, because BASIC does have that accessibility. It was great to be able to sit down and, like, type in a program from a magazine and watch it do something. And there is value to that. That's, that's the thing that I don't like about Dykstra's statement is, that like, you're, dude, you're kind of missing the fact that actually this was the introduction for computing for an entire generation. And that accessibility is important. Just like, you know, Adam, with, you know, with your son's exposure to Python, it's like... Yeah. I'm a mixed mind, and, and, and you get and you get this this feedback, right? That you, you don't need to know that much to be productive in Basic or some of some of these simple languages, and it gets gets you hooked and gets you into it. And it, and, and Dexter's statement also um, implies that one only derives sort of positive lessons from these nascent experiences, rather than kind of being able to inform more complicated thoughts. Like a, a Basic was useful for this, but it's flawed in all these other ways. Didn't he uh, advocate for Pascal as a better programming language? Uh, I, I mean, Adam mentioned Pascal in high school. Um, you know, that was my thing. I'm, I'm probably a generation ahead of that. Um, Brian, did you, did you, was, was Pascal just not a thing? Pascal was uh, no. I mean, I'm no. Pascal was uh, barely a thing, um, and I. Um, did Pascal as my second programming language on the Microsoft Pascal compiler, Pass One, Pass Two, Pass Three, Pass Four, and Pass Five, which were the programs you'd run to you would manually run the different passes of the compiler. Um, but it was, you know, it was much heavier weight. Pascal was until Turbo Pascal came out. 
Pascal was yeah, worse. Yeah, that, that was maybe the difference for us. Is it's kind of like if you put your yourself in the shoes of a like a comp sci high school teacher, um, you know, Pascal just had that that like you know it had the amazing IDE, it had the tooling. It I guess it just made teaching easier. Hang on, why are there five separate passes to the compiler that you have to run manually? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question that we should... Sh Wait, how would you automate doing five things in a row on a computer? <laughs> no, it's probably because each pass on fit we... on a floppy. Right? Uh, yeah, that is close. I think that, it, Tom, that's a great guess. Um, I mean, it is, it's hard to express how resource constrained you are. I mean, we had a... Because my my father had this idea that he was going to start a business with this computer, we had an outlandishly outsized computer with 256k um, at a time that most computers had like 32k or 64k. So it's in terms of I think Tom, you might be right about having to replace floppies to run different passes of the compiler. And so BASIC had the advantage of not needing any of that. I mean, we did need a certain amount of Moore's Law to come along before we could actually, like, get out of the primordial muck, which I think is what BASIC was kind of stuck in. And, it, uh, Aaron, you asked about uh, – well, we can talk about JavaScript in a bit because I, I think that the, the tension for me is – I think it's really important that a programming language, a first programming language, is very accessible. The danger is when someone doesn't realize what a miracle it is that what's in front of them works at all, how much complexity is there. And that's what I, I feel like we, certainly for myself, I had, I had a delusion that I understood how things worked when I, in fact, didn't, because I was given this abstraction that was pretty good. Um, and that was a, a much, much lower abstraction. Uh, and I like, how do you feel about like visual programming, Adam? Like, do you like Scratch? Oh, yeah. It, 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 very interesting. I mean, I, I used to think that it was, um, I don't know, I used to think that it was a real great tool. And, and my son spent time on that as well. And maybe it's useful when the obstacle is really the lithography of it, when you're like balancing braces is hard or, or getting the white space race is hard. So, so maybe it's sort of useful in that respect. But I so, think that like, it, it, you know, I, it, it doesn't teach any more of the structured or, or algorithmic thinking. I don't know. Well, I have implemented asteroids in LabVIEW before. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, that, you know, you can definitely get as structured and algorithmic as you darn well want to. Um, huh. Now, the amount of pain that comes with that, given that LabVIEW is not really designed for writing a program that big, um, and, and the amount of, you know, for lack of a better term, compiler hijinks you have to get into, uh, can make this a rather serious feat of engineering just to compile the darn thing. Why? So, like, look, you're curious about multiple passes of a Pascal compiler. Why are you doing Asteroids in LabVIEW? Just to, do, just to show that you could, or...? I, I mean, pretty much. Okay, yeah, interesting. Somebody put me up to it. Um, so, you know, the the language that, in my experience, has changed people's minds the most is MATLAB. Huh. Um, because it is, it is probably an entirely different way of going about things, which also makes it, if you intend to learn another language, not necessarily a great first one. Like, for example, if you're using a loop in MATLAB, something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. Um, Interesting. It is in a kind of weird place of like, I'm kind of APL and kind of a TI-83. But it's also incredibly, phenomenally good at just about anything you want to do with matrices and tensors for engineering. Um, and so do you feel that that as a first programming language is, um, I mean, clearly someone who's, for whom MATLAB is the first programming language is coming in. I, I, I mean, I wonder if that's even like, could be possible today because of, if so MATLAB Georgia would be, Ta yeah. Georgia Tech uses MATLAB for their engineering computer science 101 course. But don't you think by the time a, an 18 year old arrives, they have it's certainly a technically inclined 18 year old they have been exposed to certainly scratch if not python if not java at least in my class most people their previous programming language was excel 
Interesting. And what year did you graduate from high school, Aaron? 2000. 2000. So I, I think, I mean, our community is unusual in that there's a, a required computing course, but I think it, it is very hard to get out of high school today in general, I think, without having any exposure to a programming language. I think, I don't know, maybe that's not right. I think I, MATLAB um, is a better is... choice than, say, Java. I knew a lot of people who their introduction to computer programming was... In the beginning, the programmer said public static void main, and it was syntactically correct. I'd, I'd like to speak up in support of that. I also, I also graduated 99 or winter semester 2000. Um, I began life as a mechanical engineer. And part of how I came this direction was I realized how bad other smart people were at interacting with computers. And I just I took it for granted. I thought that was I thought all smart people were good at dealing with computers because that was just no, but no, there's lots of other ways to be smart. And a, a thought that I had while you guys are talking that ties together some of the things you've been saying is that all of these languages have different audiences, yeah. that we make assumptions that everybody is going to interact with a computer like we do. Like, I, my drive to interact with a computer had always been, if you don't know how this machine works, it's in charge of you or someone else is using it to be in charge of you. I want to be in charge of the computer, period. And... <laughs> Really, like all the way down. My, you know, I took apart every computer I ever had. Um, Tell and, that to your baseboard and... management controller. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say. Oh, I know. I, I, believe me, some of Brian's talks are my favorite for that reason too. But um, yeah, as far as I could physically see without a, you know, electron, you know, microscope, um, and all of these different communities. Because as a mechanical engineer, uh, I've used LabVIEW. I've used MATLAB. I'd used. I'd used crazy things in Excel macros um, and and also did a comp sci minor in school and did, you know, C and C++ and Lisp and everything else. Um, and my, my handle's Pearl Hack, for God's sake. Um, I've also met Larry Wall and had a similar experience as Adam, so I was laughing at the whole <laughs> That's thing. Good. Um, and and my, first made, inclination, oh, my first inclination was that he was doing a bit, um, and but it was not. <laughs> um, but the, my, my analogy that I wanted to make was that I also study human languages. I'm, I'm fairly passable in Spanish and French when I travel. Um, and my whole purpose for that is to just to be able to communicate with other people who speak those better. And each of those languages has a different mindset to it. You know, all, all these things have a, a philosophy behind them that drives their design choices. And it helps you get into the mind of other people. Um, in this case, we're all talking to the same computer. So the thing that the real lingua franca here is, is, is machine language. Um, so if you've got some exposure to machine language, and I think C is the closest thing to just above that, then you're best equipped. That's like knowing Latin and Greek, um, you know, for, for a certain family of languages anyway. Um, and, and it helps you see those other things. But yeah, it can be bad to learn basic first if you go too far with it without getting exposed to other things. But just like it, you know, English is, English is a good language because a lot of people know it, you know? So it's like knowing Java, you know, cause you can get a lot of jobs, you know, there's a lot of jobs out there with Java. Um, but if you only know Java, you're going to be bigoted towards it. Just like an American who never travels. So like, there's an interesting bigoted... analog to this in, in natural languages. Uh, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's super interesting is, um, I don't know if folks know about Esperanto. So Esperanto is this uh, sort of invented spoken language, which is the interesting property that it's a context, context-free um, uh, grammar. So, you know, well, yeah, that might be interesting from a sort of machine um, uh, natural language processing point of view. But there's all these research papers that look into if we teach our children Esperanto, which is, I guess, kind of a weird thing to do. Do they acquire a second language easier than somebody that, for instance, learned English or Spanish first? And there's there's a fair I don't know. Um, Brian, I think you mentioned at some point that that your wife is into linguistics. Have have you encountered this this idea of of um, natural languages and context free ones and you know how that affects the development of the mind? Well, yeah, and I think that I mean, well, and this is what I got into this with conversation with Arthur about people that um, for whom their first language is a tonal language, and it is really, really hard for me to do to uh, learn a tonal language as someone who grew up in, and in particular, one of the things that I learned about myself when I we uh, we went to when uh, my oldest was very young, we went to this like Mandarin circle time 
which I would thought this would be a good idea. Just like get them exposed to different. This is kind of a goofy idea we had. And so they're doing like colors in Mandarin. I'm like, all right, this is good. I'm going to like learn to speak. I'm going to learn to say the colors in Mandarin. And a friend of mine's a native Mandarin speaker. So I was very excited to boast that I had learned how to say purple in Mandarin. So I, you know, bounce it off her. She's like, I have got like absolutely no clue what you're trying to say. And I like <laughs> probably, she's like, I, are you like, you're saying sister-in-law? I'm like, no, no, I'm not saying sister-in-law. I'm saying, you know, I got I to gotta repeat this again and again and again. And finally, I'm, like, I, I, I'm trying to say purple. And she's like, oh, you're trying to say, and like to my ear, repeated back exactly what I was saying. But it obviously was not. And I'm like, I don't have, I can't hear the difference here. I, I like, this is just like, these languages are just going to be off the menu for me. And it is hard not to think like, surely this, <laughs> and, you know, I think that, that, you know, in terms of music and so on, you got to think that like, this does a change the way mm -hmm. you, you, you think to a certain degree. And so it's, it's hard not to think that it has some impact. Um, but I think there's also a big difference between natural language and a, and a computer language. Um, that clearly parallels, but um, there are, uh, I mean, our, our computer programming languages are much, much, much smaller than natural languages. And they're, they've got very different problems they're trying to solve. But tangentially, I wonder, if you grew up with a bunch of people who were speaking Chinese non-tonally, would you get the gist of it eventually? I don't even, well, I so mean like- maybe, Right, so like if, if, if speaking Chinese the way someone who does not speak Chinese attempts to speak Chinese. Well, I, so- with, right? well, And if everyone around you was speaking that, whatever that language is, well, so remember, even though the you, word has like six different meanings. So you're talking like I, Mandarin or Cantonese, and you're not talking, I mean, you're not, there's not spoken Chinese, right? You're speaking a, right, the, yes, and yeah, these are languages that are not, like, you can't, there's no such thing as, this is part of the reason why these languages are really tough. If you are coming from a non-tonal language, you can't. There's 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 no such thing as non-tonal because the tone changes. Like in particular, for someone like me, or at least one thing about myself, I use inflection a lot, and you cannot use inflection because you are changing what you're saying. Right, but there are like somewhat similar things in other languages, like buffalo, 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 buffalo. Right, where it's the same word used you know six different ways well that's that's inferring from from position um and and experience but um the the thing with tonal languages is that there's there's a specific region of your brain for language and it's different for you know it's different from everything else like it's different from singing like singing is different from speaking um there are people who have brain damage and they can't speak They've gotten an injury, but they can sing what they're thinking. It's it's totally it's that totally separate. Um, and related to that is the part of that part of the brain that processes the auditory information coming in. And it, it you know those those neural paths get strengthened. And if by a, like age twelve you haven't been exposed to a tonal language speaker that you're really trying to understand, then the other pathways that you're using get strengthened so much that yes, you can develop that ability, but it takes a lot of immersion and a lot of, it takes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of effort um, for comparatively little success. But do we think there's something analogous in a computer programming environment? If you like, right. started programming when you were 12 and you were 30 the first time you ran across a non-garbage collected language. Um, I, think, I, think I think it depends on how far you've Absolutely gone. Absolutely there is. Absolutely there is. Yeah, I think the big gap is between the imperative languages and the functional. And logic. You know, B Basic and Fortran kind of look alike, but throw MATLAB or... So if you raised your kid on closure, they would suddenly be seeing all these mutable <laughs> state bugs and be like, wait, what happened here? How did it... it I just looked at it. It can't be something different now. I mean, well, everybody, there, there everybody also... liked, but like when I started learning Rust, um, it was amazing how that influenced me writing C again. Even though I've been writing C for you know twenty five years or something. There, yeah, there is and, also and the well known effect of once you understand monads, you become completely incapable of explaining them to anyone who does not. <laughs> hey, a monad is just a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I'm totally ruined for functional programming from my childhood Fortran. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there's something to be said that the idea that you learn a language and you learn it well, that really does influence how you think about things. I, you know, like, like the big shift in my mind was when I really truly learned how to, how to program in Lisp. That was a totally different paradigm than programming in C, and it really changed the way that I thought about computation. So, yeah, the, was, it, it, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say I had a similar experience where I learned C and C++ before Scheme as a dialect of Lisp, and, and then learning Lisp was like, oh, God, this is like freedom. It's like once you write something, you know, I don't ever have to touch that thing again. I can, I can wrap something around it if I want. To modify it but once i get that one idea right it's it's done you know like the idea of changing that again is crazy because now i've got 15 other things depending on it well yeah and Aaron, you'd asked about javascript and that actually learning javascript javascript was the first time i'd used a closure so dan to your kind of point about you know having this kind of light go on i just i, I did have to light up a new area of my brain um to and i i then felt that javascript and i do i still feel that javascript is mistaught to those for whom it is their second programming language, where I, I really think that JavaScript should start with closures. And I think TypeScript has made this a lot better. Um, but I remember like discovering, like I just had no idea that there was a real programming language there. Um, we were using JavaScript because we had to, because we had, that's what we had to do in the browser. And oh, yeah, JavaScript is scheme for the browser. It really is. Well, it's plus plus some other pitfalls, but the, I think everybody's first JavaScript book should be JavaScript: The Good Parts. It's the only JavaScript book on my desk. <laughs> a book written several years after we were doing this, right? So this yeah. this is in yeah. we. And again, I feel like I mean, Adam, I feel like you and I were part of a like wildebeest migration of computer science grads uh, going into JavaScript for the first time in 2006. I mean, I think a lot of people. Did this? I mean, I saw Matt Rainey here. I know Matt was doing the same kind of thing at the same kind of time, where we were discovering this actual real programming language. What well, year was V eight? Speaking of JavaScript and speaking of early languages, uh, I just want to note as a footnote, I did say that Perl was basically my first language. In fact, I wrote some JavaScript. I think it's unrecognizable, basically, and someone will have to call me on the year. But in, like in nineteen ninety four because I wanted to make like a counter spin. The code is miraculously somehow still on the internet. Um, what? But, you know, I, 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 did, I did have a long history of, uh, of JavaScript before oh, we did it, you know, 20 years later. Hold on, the code that you wrote in 1994 is still on the internet? How? You know what, I posted it to some um, like Usenet forum and I can always find it because I misspelled language and somehow like, you know, language equals JavaScript, and somehow the browser was still fine with that. So it ma makes it easier to search for. And are you, I, I mean, I, like, I can't imagine some of my first basic programs being on the internet. I think I would be mortified, but I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. while we're, while we're talking, I'll, I'll see if I can dredge it up. And I mean, so 1994, I mean, that is like super early. That's, I mean, that's, that's live script era, right? That is like super, yeah, super I, early I, JavaScript. I, because I was a kid, I put a copyright date on it because I don't want anyone stealing my right. you know, proprietary JavaScript, you know? So uh, well, that, that, that's before Java was named. So it couldn't have been JavaScript then, right? Okay. Well, then, then let me go. I'll, I'll find the code and it'll, it'll, you know, have the year on it, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, when it's obviously it's, it's well before 2000. So it's got to be in that, that 90s era of, um, but I, and I do think that you know, it, it, Aaron, you were asking like, is there an analog? I do feel that that we um, can adapt. Certainly, I think that like we can learn new computing languages early, easier, much easier than we can learn new spoken languages. I just don't think that we our circuitry hardens so much around computer languages as it does around spoken languages. And I mean, Nate, you raised a really good point earlier about like. We've got a bunch. There are there are obviously many different languages, and it's easy to be judgmental, as Dijkstra obviously is, about those those early languages. To me, the most important attribute of those early languages is breeding an enthusiasm for um, for computing. I mean, that, that, that's actually the most important role of an early programming language is that you get excited without getting arrogant. I feel. Oh yeah, and that's that's really one of my cringiest memories that I still. You know, those things that you like wake up at three in the morning and you're like, oh, you remember that time um, where we were using um, we were using LabVIEW in a class in one of my mechanical engineering classes. And 
me being like steeped in computer science stuff and being like the, in the mechanical engineering building, I was the resident, you know, computer expert and, and just being like, Oh, what is this garbage? You know, and just being totally elitist about it. Um, like a 19 year old and, and just completely made them feel bad about it. And they were like, what's wrong with it? I don't understand. And I was like, Oh, this is just horrible. You know? And, and I had no good reason for it really. And it was, it, it was like, they're like, but, but look at what you can do with it. Like it's, it's, so easy to wire up what I need to do and I don't have to write any code. I don't have to maintain where my files live, I, you know, all these things. And I, I wouldn't have any of it. And, and now I just cringe thinking about it. Well, yeah. And, and the Dykstra's screed is loaded with that kind of cringe. And I think that it is, Nate, I think you're right in terms of like the, um, the you, ne you never want to stomp on that enthusiasm for computational programmable logic, wherever it's coming from. If people are excited about, you know, Excel is, is one of the most important programming languages, right? And that's the, for, there are a lot of people who, for whom they don't think of themselves as technologists, and then they're doing actually very complicated spreadsheets. And it's like, you're programming. Uh, and, and creating real value. And there's businesses and, you know, huge businesses and, you know, financials that run on Excel spreadsheets that have been maintained for 20 years. And, and you can't underestimate the value of the real computer science underneath of that. That's Microsoft maintaining ridiculous levels of binary level com backward compatibility for that long that enable those businesses to live that way. You know, that's, that's where we should be talking about is like, look cool. at the wizardry that goes into that. Don't, don't worry about the, the normals, you know, actually using the computers. You know, we live in between that. So, yeah, so you mentioned the uh, cringe moments that, you know, a couple of people here have mentioned moments using uh, spoken languages that were a little cringy, maybe just a little uncomfortable. Uh, and I think the reason that we retain the ability to learn programming languages uh, better than spoken languages later in life has a lot to do with the purpose. The costs of getting something wrong in spoken language are pretty high. They're generally social costs, but there could be others. The cost of getting something wrong in a computer language is super low. You just try, try, try again, and you don't tell anybody about the embarrassing moments. But I think that that's the the real thing that I think separates people in terms of how they uh, go about their programming career based on their first programming experiences isn't so much language. It's about whether they did it socially or not. If they did it in a classroom and they heard at somebody say Etsy in like, you know, an intro to Linux class, if you heard Etsy, you'll say that because it's a lot cheaper to say Etsy. In my mind, I did like, you know, I played with like BSDs, Linux all throughout the mid 90s, solo, lived rural area, didn't have anybody other than people on the internet to talk to about it. And I said, et cetera, in my head for years. And it took me until about 2003 or four before I finally gave up correcting people because I was, it was just, just so wrong to me. But throughout my career, I've noticed that there's p other people who basically learned solo all through reading. I will have like sort of a shorthand in, say, pull requests where I can much more easily understand what other people who learned solo are trying to communicate in their code versus somebody who's learned in a classroom who was told how to do things by another human and had yeah, the ability to interact more. Yeah, I think you're nailing it. There, there's a huge cultural component that goes along with the language. And if you're, if you're not a member of that culture, then the language is very different. There's also... Uh, I and I, I, I think a, a lot of us old timers had to learn language, computer language from a book. But these days people can dive into GitHub and see a huge corpus of code. And it's, it's a whole different experience. OK, so actually, yeah. And, you know, the line numbers started out as a way to communicate uh, to the computer, I think, in basic. But uh, thankfully, when I got to quick basic line numbers weren't there anymore. But I still used them uh, to talk to people, uh, you know, to refer to a line in an article in Byte magazine, for instance, they were still useful for that. So interesting, Drew, and I think Tom, you are bringing up an important point that if you if there is if there is a modern analog to Dijkstra's concern, I do get concerned about people who because Tom, you're right. You know, back in the day, you bought you had to buy a book to learn a, a programming language, and just like your camel book, Adam, and that is people want to dive in and be instantly kind of successful with the language. And to me, that's a real contrast that Rust has with other programming languages that Rust doesn't, Rust will punish you if you try to cut your pace, your way to success, that you actually want to 
sit down and I had done with Rust I and with with the the Rust programming language book the uh, with the programming Rust book excuse me with the the O'Reilly book I did something that I had not done since my days of basic I, I sat down and typed in someone else's program and boy did I appreciate the pedagogical value of doing that like I hadn't I hadn't needed to have done that for many many years but I would really recommend it for anyone learning Rust because it, it it allows you because typing in programs someone else's program actually has value you you begin to learn like the tool chain you learn how it's broken I don't know Adam have you, did you ever did you ever do that did you ever type and, yeah I mean it's definitely as a kid like I would I uh, and this must have been basic but like on our Commodore sixty four I was type like that's how you played games like you either put in the audio cassette that could like have the game already on it or this spiral bound book of magical codes you would type in meticulously and the third or fourth time you'd get it right. Um, not the same pedagogical experience, but like certainly like later on, you know, with these Perl books or whatever, yeah, you'd, you'd try it at home. You know, I tried on my Mac and it was amazing to be able to reproduce what they were showing us. And I don't know what I feel about that. You know, I know that he's a controversial figure in his own right, but Zed Shaw is very big on this idea that like you learn languages with re repetition, and that you should learn to program a language the way you'd learn to like I play totally the guitar. Disagree with that. Well, I, I totally not disagree. all languages. Well, I totally disagree languages. with that. I'm sorry. That yeah. that is that is just ridiculous. You do not. Th this is th that that goes back to these people who have these like code kata things, and you know, this is not a martial art, all right? You do not gain the muscle memory of writing a for loop by typing it in 10,000 times. And it, like the way that you learn, say, a punch or a kick or a strike in the martial arts. That's just absurd. Like, well, and, yeah, well, I, 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 really I don't know if that's yeah, true. Right? I used and, to and make a lot of off by one errors in for loops. Right. And in, like in all languages, a for loop is the same, right? Like pretty much give or take the syntax changes a little bit here, a little bit there. The important thing is understanding what it does. Right. And like, there is this strange thing about software where like, if there's not a physical artifact, people seem to feel this need to add a ton of religion on top of it, which is like one of the things that's really off putting to a lot of people who try to learn rust is that like you must accept this you know this religious text to begin with <laughs> and you know like the more you can avoid at least for some people the more you can avoid the the books and the culture and the surroundings of it the better it is to actually accomplish things with the machine right um especially when that doesn't necessarily align with accomplishing things it aligns with you know proving that you're, you're Dijkstra and you're more arrogant than everyone else or whatever. Well, something to bear in mind about Dijkstra's thing, and, and I, I feel like this comes up in these discussions kind of frequently, there was a context to when he was writing that. And, you know, like, I, I don't recall exactly when he wrote the thing, sometime in the late 70s, but, you know, he's, he's looking at it from a very specific context, right? You know, this is the emergence of structured programming. That was still a very controversial idea at the time. You know, you have this completely unstructured programming language, and you have a lot of people who have basically learned by not having a body of expertise to which they could go to sort of vet their own ideas about things. I, I think this is something this discussion has kind of danced around, but not really confronted. But well, it so bears on what you just mentioned. There, there is like expertise in the form of books was highly useful 30 years ago. It, it, it wasn't a religious thing. And, and I would go so far as to say that the opposite is kind of true these days. These days, the religious places that you go to are Stack Overflow, so you can cargo cult somebody else's snippet of code to open a file or something like that, because that's weird these days for some reason. Or, you know, you go to like the Uncle Bobs of the world who are going to say, well, you, you must genuflect in this way and write your tests before you write your code. And then, and only then, will you be pure enough to be blessed by the compiler. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, well, so actually, just a bit of a broader context of Dyke, just, I mean, we actually, he throws a bunch of other languages under the bus, including a couple that are structured. So I think that he was just, just wanting to kind of sound off in this, in this piece. Um, I do. Well, well Dyke, Dyke, sir, was by then a, a well-known flamer anyway, so it's. 
is all in keeping up with his personality. And, and probably the only reason he got published was because he was already well known. Well, and, and there were also a lot of languages that were highly deserving of being thrown under the bus back then. Cough PL1, Cough yeah. Ada, <laughs> Cough Algo 68. I mean, like, you know, the, like the, the languages of the day. Hey, Algo 68 changed the world. Yeah, sure. Its report sure did. I don't know about the language itself. I think I think alcohol is part. Well, but a lot of those, those languages were important, right? I mean, I think that they all and well, Al- Al- Algol sixty was certainly. I mean, the, the the languages were enormously important. The thing about Algol sixty eight was that it was so complex that there were very few like real implementations of it. Right. Yeah. The and PL one obviously had the same issue. PL one was. A, yeah. I mean, there, the, again, there's there there are there are nuggets of truth to to everything that that that's kind of being said. One question I have is because I definitely have this about like Rust in particular. Where does Rust belong in kind of the progression of languages? Because I don't think that Rust should be a first programming language. I don't think. Um, I mean, I, I I don't know, Adam. What do you? I, I think I think the progression is nonlinear. That's the answer. <laughs> The, well, it's got, a, Rust, it's got a very, very important place. Rust is what happens when you when you got 25 years of experience with C++ and you say, what would this language look like if we removed most of the rough edges and made it safer? You would end up with something that looks an awful lot like Rust. When so you say I, where it I belongs, do you mean the that. family tree or like which languages should you learn in which order? I, I, the latter. I mean, if, 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 a, if we want to... And I, I first of all, I want to. I just want to restate my agreement with what Nate said earlier. That I think that whatever any, I, I'm actually uh, even for Adam, even for your kids, even for my own kids, um, I am non-judgmental about the path people take to computing as long as they are enjoying computational logic and program programmatic logic. That's the most important thing. And I think like my daughter programs in scratch and minecraft are the kind of her the things that she gets very excited about and the, the you know the redstone engineering stuff on minecraft i think has got a very programmatic kind of element to it i think that's great the kind of the question is where do, if you kind of envision a progression that you, for someone who wants to get kind of deeper and deeper into computing where you know does a like i personally think that a language that c still has an important role i think that you nate i think you called it the latin or greek um i i think that's a good analogy i think that you you need at some point to learn enough c to appreciate what it is and what it isn't um I don't know that, like, I don't think anyone should ever learn C++. I think C++ is just a mistake. Um, but obviously, that's, I'm beginning to sound like Dijkstra. Um, I, I certainly hey, wish we, that, brain uh, I, I wish that if, uh, that I had been taught Rust instead of C++. Um, like, I got thrown into C++, like, it was really weird. Like, our first, first programming language, first year of college was Java. Um, and then, and then, second year, you get thrown into this uh, data structures and algorithms course, which actually Edwin is on the call. He was he actually taught me that. Um, cool, he doesn't nice. remember that, which is kind cool, of nice. which is kind of kind of funny. Um, but it was like it's like you know Java, so here's C plus plus. And most people hadn't seen C at that point, which is like okay. So, <laughs> like all of this memory management stuff is like it's like you had a garbage collector, now you don't. And by the way, we don't care about the language; we we care about you know hash tables and and trees and things like that. Um, at that point, if somebody gave me a Rust, I would have preferred that. Well, and so that's a, that's really interesting, because Adam. You were a part of a real revolution of so the I, Adam and I share an alma mater, but Adam was five years um, five years later than I was. And you were because you were in they they basically redid the intro curriculum um, to get yeah. scheme much earlier, which I thought was really interesting. Um, That's right. So so for many years they had taught a object oriented uh, intro class for first and second semester freshman year that was all in Java, I, I, you know, as a but as a means to teaching object oriented programming. And these two professors who were kind of one from a more AI background and one from a uh, algorithms background, but kind of iconoclastically wanted, and, and this was taught by, uh, you know, this intro class was taught by Andy Van Dam, who just got the computer history award. Like this is a, a, a kind of a legend in the field of graphics, but they wanted to kind of break with that tradition a little bit. And so, yeah, we, we started in scheme uh, and then th- it was a full year course and then went to ML and then went to Java at the end. 
in part to prepare people from subsequent classes that was had been assuming this object oriented background. Um, and just amusingly at the time, we the version of OM, uh, of ML we were using, and this was in probably like 1998, was OCaml. And as I recall, the error messages were in French, or like many of them were <laughs> when you got to like really deep. Like, yeah, that sounds like, right. So that that was that was you know good to good to learn some other languages at the time. Um, blue. That's right. <laughs> and Adam, did you, did, right. did you take the new sequence or no? So I I took the old sequence. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. And then I and then I helped create the subsequent sequence, the the new sequence. So I I, I think I was of a, a, a rare breed that got kind of both of those things to be able to compare. And and to your question about Rust, like that that was my first reaction when when trying rust and it, and it was my, my attempts with the rust were painful because i approached it i think brian the way that you advocate no one approaches it which was sort of like head on don't learn anything okay just, well so I, I, mean, and, I mean we got to go to a little bit of because and so my first exposure to rust was your first exposure to rust right, so right. my first exposure to rust was reading your blog entry about rust and as you are reading and this is uh in 20 i want to say like 15 2016 something like that yeah, like, yeah, 14, 15, yeah. So it's early. <laughs> and right. as, like, this blog entry, you're just watching Adam punch himself in the face over and over again. And I'm thinking to myself, I, as I'm reading this blog entry, I am really glad Adam is doing this, so I never have to learn this programming language. So this is a it's disaster. Because it's, it's because he has to unlearn all the Perl first. I mean, I, I personally <laughs> don't, I don't. I don't think Rust would be a bad first language because it's, oh, it's really... Well, hold on, Edwin. You see, you should go read the blog entry because this is in 2015 and this is early Rust and it is brutal. It is all blade, no handle. And the the, the thing that was so interesting to me, and Adam, I've referred to this since then, is the last line... That I, I get to the end of your blog entry and I am thinking to myself, thank God that Adam has thrown himself in the traffic, so I never have to learn this programming language. And the closing sentence of that blog entry is like, in conclusion, I'm kind of looking forward to doing some more Rust in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, and it was brutal. And I think the thing that that, that experience taught me was that there was, there was actually something different there. And the mistake I had made was thinking, you know, I, I had done a bunch of different programming languages, functional, object-oriented, procedural, declarative. Like, I thought I had all of the tools, and I didn't. And that was the thing that was so interesting about Rust. And I think the, the interesting uh, part about it to, to think about how it would be included in a curriculum is because it actually does introduce a different concept. Yeah. And so I think, I can't remember who said it just now, but you know, Rust as a first programming language, I think is a terrible idea I mean, with, with respect, just because I, I think it builds on some of these other concepts that are much easier to learn in isolation. So my fantasy, you know, uh, for, for like, if I ever got to teach a, a like a junior level or senior level class would would be this kind of comparative literature of different programming languages Ooh, and techniques yeah. and models. Ooh. Because it, it's not, you know, it, it, one of the things we've touched on in this conversation is there's no right programming language, right? You, you don't say like, which is the best? And it depends all on what you're doing. Like even Perl probably, possibly like has its place, maybe even basic, I don't know. But it, it, it's dependent on the task that you're you're doing, and I think the the p important part, or a thing that a computer science education, a formal computer science education, where in particular in modern times where it can you know earn its value, is by giving people a bunch of tools, like filling up that tool belt, so when they come to new problems, they can know, uh, you know, this might best be solved with you know object oriented programming or functional programming or something like Rust. There, there's a, a tension too in learning between the people who hate magic and want to know how everything works in great detail versus the people who just want to see something useful done. So it's kind of top down versus bottoms up. I think on both of those people, it's really hard to satisfy process. both. Yeah. I think there are, people who really say, there are people who think, you know, you can't do object oriented programming in C and of course you can. And so, uh, but you, but if you've only done C, it would, it would never occur to you. So I think having this comparative approach, you know, as Dan was saying, you know, learning Rust informed the way that he wrote C, and I, and I think that uh, you, you can see that blending, but only as you've been exposed to these different concepts in, in different languages. Yeah, I do think it's interesting that, like, yeah. actually, to be most effective, you need to learn a couple of different languages. Which, of course, like, I mean, 
many software engineers have. And Edwin, I'm sorry, I mean, you were getting in here. I didn't mean to, to step on you there in terms of the... Um, first of all, do you remember teaching Simeon algorithms or not? Uh, it was a big class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a no. <laughs> um, but you, so I, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say I have an earnest question that I don't have a loaded answer for. Is that if you hadn't cut your fingers and shot yourself in the face with C++ up enough, would you have the same appreciation for uh, and and motivation for the rigor for, for learning Rust? Well, so I remember coming to... Um, I, I broke up with C++ in college. I, I, there was no way I was going to write another line in C++ after 1996. Um, that was out of self-preservation. So I am not coming to Rust from C++. I'm coming to Rust from C. Um, and what I, th th which gives me a different set of challenges and biases, but also a different set of strengths. I mean, one of the things that I definitely did, uh, because I didn't exactly learn from Adam's blog entry, is I wanted to, to implement a doubly linked list in Rust to solve a particular problem that I had. And uh, that is not a good thing to go do in Rust. In fact, there's even a great blog series called So You Really Want to Write a Doubly Linked List in Rust that spends the first like five entries trying to talk you out of doing this. Um, which <laughs> I write I, a linked list in Rust. Step one, consider using a B tree instead. Well, that's it. And, and uh, it, when especially a doubly linked list, because the, and I do think, Adam, this goes to your earlier point about there is a big new concept in Rust around ownership. And a doubly linked list is a multiply owned data structure. And it, therefore, is a very, very, very bad match for Rust. It's possible, but it's going to really hurt, and you've really got to ask yourself why you're doing it. You don't have to teach that in a first course in Rust. I mean, you don't build doubly linked lists in Python either. either. You try to totally. get things done in Python, yep. right? So, so you can expose only the bits that that teach you what you need to teach. I, I don't think you need to get into all of the the complexity right away. If you if you were doing Rust as a first course. But some part of it is fundamentally just a subset of all the bad things, right? Like, you, you, well, you, rather, the, the subset is left after you've taken away all the bad things. So I was surprised in this group no one mentioned Erlang as a language that really changes the way you think. That's because we haven't found a group in, the, in this discussion to break it in. But it is... It is honestly what I would consider the closest thing to a Rust ancestor in that it acknowledges the laws of physics exist on multi-core systems. <laughs> well, I, I think it had a huge influence on Go, which is rather more popular now. No, I, I can tell you for sure that's not the case. Yeah. Um, go tried to go yeah, straight no, all the no. way back to CSP. <laughs> Yeah, no, CSP. So, I mean, like Rob Pike did a series of five languages, Go is the latest one of which, that were all centered around using CSP as a concurrency primitive. Um, but Erlang, I don't think, had a significant influence. Hmm. Yeah, Erlang, I, I am too colored by the systems that I had to deal with that were written in Erlang and their pathologies. So I feel that I cannot speak without bias on Erlang. I am too biased by, uh, by RabbitMQ and by, by React, um, RabbitMQ especially, which was a real struggle. Um, that it w I, there are things that are really interesting about Erlang, but I found that when it misbehaved, it was very, very difficult to determine what was going on. Um, and that uh, Ryan can get in here to correct. Yeah, Ryan, yeah, Ryan. Zeski has done a lot. It's done a lot of Erlang, a lot of C, and a lot of Rust. So maybe you can provide some perspective here. It, well, it, well, it, I, I, I was just going to say that it, your problems were not with necessarily Erlang language, but certainly Erlang the runtime system, which certainly has had its share share of issues. Yeah, that's an interesting it, distinction, it, it, actually, Ryan. So do you want to elaborate a little bit? Because I think you're right. I think that it's like, and it was also my problems are also with Rabbit itself, but the with. I think Beam as a runtime versus Erlang a language, I think are two pretty different things. Yeah, and that just that just goes back to its history. I mean, it started from Prolog. Uh, uh, Joe um, Armstrong, the creator, uh, or the primary creator, had a love for, an affinity for Prolog. And he kind of tried to combine Prolog and C++ and all kinds of other ideas and put it all together. And that was Beam. And then you can imagine coming out of that when it got rewritten in C, you know, it, 
it has a storied history. And so, you know, Ertz and trying to do many to one uh, or many to many thread mapping in user space and stuff like that, just it has issues. Yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, I think that that is honestly, that's part of the tremendous appeal of Rust is that you, oh, that runtime component is a big challenge when languages go into production. The, the runtime, whether it's the JVM, whether it's V8, whether it's the Go runtime, whether it's Beam, like the, I, I find that I spend a lot of time with the runtime and then I, it, it, not necessarily observing the language as it was kind of designed to be implemented, but rather having to deal with it operationally and the, not having a runtime has got a real appeal to it. That's one nice thing about Rust. That's why we chose it for our last project at Google. I mean, it, you know, I, I was looking around and I, we were going to do a new kernel and I was like, I don't want to do this in C. And, you know, what are your design criteria? It's like, well, I, I don't want to run time. I mean, sort of the obvious of the choice was Go because, you know, the Go team sat in the next office and I could go ask them questions and things like that. But it was like, well, I don't, I don't want to, you know, like, I don't want to transport the entire Go runtime into ring zero in kernel context. That's going to be a disaster. And also, that's going to force a particular shape on the design of my system that you know may or may not be a good fit for the system. And so the only other choice that seemed reasonable at the time was Rust. And I remember looking at it and being like, this is a big, ugly language, and I don't like it. But it has a small runtime, and it's easy to get into from assembly language. That's, that has real value to me. And so we, we started using it and we were kind of skeptical and we basically said, well, if we, you know, if this thing will do a quarter of what they promise it will, that'll be useful. And it really did exceed our expectations and we grew to like it. It was an interesting experience. Well, and I think that there's another element of Rust that I am, that I don't, I think if I, I, you know, I wrote a couple of blog entries on like, as I learn more and more about the language, but I do feel that the ability Rust is its own build system that in that the, between not just proc macros, but the ability to actually uh, dynamically change what, what is compiled puts the dynamicism out of the runtime and into the compile system, uh, into the compiler, which is a pretty interesting, but it's a big cognitive shift. You know, it's, it's one that is, doesn't really have a lot of parallel. I don't think. Oh, Lisp macros have been doing that for, for decades. You know, yeah, but you find out about them at runtime. <laughs> it, you know, I should know better than to actually, I know it all goes back to Lisp. And also clean, I guess, is a big, uh, 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 there's a clean is a language that apparently is, uh, has an outsized influence um, on, on Rust. But the... It, it really is interesting to look at the DNA of all the languages that are under discussion here. I mean, like Scratch has come up a few times. And if you really look at that, it's basically Logo. Just, you know, transported into the pseudo visual environment. And if you look at Logo, Logo was again heavily influenced by Lisp. So, okay, you know, they, I feel, they, Dan, did you learn Logo? Because actually, you actually basic is my first language. I did. Like, Logo was actually yeah. the first, like, and I, Logo did not light a fuse for me at all. I think it's like, I just remember like it be like the turtle not knowing how to box. Like I don't care if you know how to draw a box or not, turtle. I guys for me it was not a good fit. But I think there for others it might I don't know. Did you really get lit well, up by logo? No, I have, so, so I, I think logo so I, I got confused when I was in high school because people people that I knew that were into computers, and I didn't start getting into computers until I was like fifteen or something. And People who I knew who seemed like they really knew what they were talking about, they programmed in basic for the most part, but like quick basic under DOS. And people were like, you know, somebody told me, well, you should look at Logo. And because I was like the long haired skater kid, they were like, this guy can't possibly understand anything about computers. You should go play with Logo. And the irony of that is that Logo itself is actually a much more capable programming language than basic is and, and ever could be. Huh. Yeah. I, you know, they had lexical scope. They had all these kind of nifty things that we think of as being part of, like, real programming languages. But the only thing that, you know, people ever really were exposed to was the, was the turtle. The turtle. The and what, turtle. what I think happened there was I, I, I think that, you know, the 1980s, early 1980s, microcomputer explosion happens. People are like, oh, my God, this is big. We need to teach kids how to use computers. All of a sudden, computers are flooding public schools. And public school teachers most of whom at the time had gone to college in like the 50s and 60s, yeah. 
or basically being told go teach computer programming to like eight year olds. And like, like these people had no idea what they were doing. They were not computer scientists. They were like, you know, I teach basic reading, writing and arithmetic. I mean, that was very much the model in public schools at the time. And so I suspect that what happened with logo was that, you know, it was over promised and under delivered because it, the introduction of the thing was not managed well. And the people who were teaching it were not themselves experts at it. This is why American kids hate mathematics so much. They think math is hard, not because math is hard. I mean, parts of it, of course, are difficult, but rather because it's not taught well, because the people who are teaching it themselves don't understand it necessarily. Yeah, that's interesting. And well, I think that, I mean, to contrast, and maybe this is what you're saying that like, because Scratch, I actually feel is, uh, I think Scratch is a good first programming language for kids. Scratch, I think is a good introduction for young kids to learn how to program. I think it's, it's very visual, but to me is better than, much better than Logo. And I think actually better than Basic too, because it requires you to think in terms of blocks of computation. And I, I mean, I certainly don't think that uh, I that we are having mutilated minds because of Scratch. Uh, that, that would seem... Um, Dijkstra but I, would be satisfied with how structured it is. Yeah, I think Dijkstra would be satisfied. Well, I mean, I don't think that... Yeah, exactly. I would I'd agree satisfied with anything. Although somebody replied to my tweet being like, man, what would that dude have done with YAML? I mean, it's like, you think... I, I just don't think Dijkstra could have, could have survived. I, I think he, it, it's best that he passed on because I don't think he could have made it in the, in the modern era. Wow. <laughs> Damn, right? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe on that note, maybe on that, on that, on that, so I, I apologize to th th those still mourning the loss of the, of the great Dykstra. Although actually, you know, I, I'm going to end on one other complaint. He's got in there. He said that, that anthropomorphizing machines is a sign of professional immaturity or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I love that line. You're like, we're still immature. Well, and also it's like, Hey, asshole. How many times have I had to explain what P and V mean to people because of you? You anthropomorphized the system <laughs> with a fucking railroad and left the rest of us to explain it, that these are like terms in Dutch. That it's like you, you left us with one of our strangest anthropomorphizations in, in system software as far as I'm concerned. And it's like, oh, anyway, maybe, maybe, that was a, maybe that was a sign of regret. I don't know. I, 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 and, and Brian – um, on the note of anthropomorphizing the machine, I know you guys were doing Bring Up last week. How's it going? Yeah, well, yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. Um, we uh, we didn't really blow anything up, which is good. I mean, Bring Up can go very poorly. Um, it's gone well. We've got a we we're making good progress, and I would say that um, uh, I squared C level translators are the devil's own handiwork. I think that the the strangest problem we had was due to a. Uh, a level translator that wasn't powered up and was behaving extremely strangely as a result. Um, but yeah, things have gone, so th things have gone pretty well. I will have a lot more to talk about. Um, I would, at some point it would be, the thing about bring up is that there are kind of these, uh, these, you know, moments where you're kind of moving on to the next stage where it's kind of like gripped with terror. And then there's a long period of time where you're verifying and backfilling and trying to figure out, you know, reworking and so on. So it's, I, but at some point in Oxide's life, we've got to do like a, I think it'd be fun to do like a live stream of a bring up. So, you yeah, know, it's fun. We're, we're having a good time learning a lot and not blowing. I think we had, we, we had one power stage that we learned, uh, it was being pushed beyond its its rating. So that thing did blow up. Uh, and we, we did rework that board, but that board can't quite fly right as a result. So that one is never going to take a, a socket. That one is oh, will we'll forever. Uh, the the doubly in charge of that actually put super glue on the socket. So that one is never going to take a socket. I'm never going to take a CPU. Yeah, that'll that that'll do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and do, do I squared C level translators ever work, even in like even when you power them properly? <laughs> well, I, like, yeah, I, yeah. I try to be. I, 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 I squared C is really uh, it, it, it embodies both um, the power and the peril of laxity in engineering. There is a great, uh, it's the ability to, to hook up systems that have never spoken to one another and share only two wires and have them have a meaningful conversation is kind of amazing at some level. And then the fact that it goes horribly wrong is perhaps not as surprising. I mean, I squared C is the well-defined one of the two. 
<laughs> between that and Spy. Uh, yes, uh, yes. I, uh, Spy for those the the the, the serial peripheral interconnect and uh, I squared C is the inter uh, IC interconnect, right? The uh, inter IC. Yes, inter 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 integrated circuit. Inter integrated circuit. Yeah, you realize that, like, as you're like yeah. doing what the acronym stands for, you're like, aren't we missing a letter somewhere in there? But the uh, well, and then then there's then there's I three C, which is I3C, the faster one, right? Which they just incremented. That doesn't actually have another I. It, it, um, and one wire, which is like I actually I'm kind of like perversely attracted to, which is just a single wire. Um, but the uh, I ended up writing a bunch of code for it, but we're not using that anywhere. But um, yeah, we'll have a lot more. Sorry, to be you know, this is like uh, we got to first language, then you got like first bus protocols. Although actually, I do think like teaching I squared C, I would teach I squared C to high scores actually at this point. I, I did teach I squared C to probably a thousand college freshmen. Did you? How did it go? Because I think it's like I I think it's like pretty neat actually at some level when it's not terrible. Yeah, I mean you you've got to pick the chips you teach on, right? You don't start off with like you know some of the really awful ones, um, but. Yeah, it, it generally went pretty well, um, you know, getting people to understand bidirectional buses that are driven and are floating and pulled up and, hey, guys, put the pull-ups on your breadboard and, no, don't put them on both ends and, you know, things like that. Um, it's like on a hardware level, that's fairly simple once you get the hang of it. Um like in the context of microcontroller programming where you have like 128 bytes of RAM and everyone's just losing their minds if they took CS1 first anyway. Um, it's, you know, it, it's appropriate for the context. Yeah, I think that would be neat, actually. I, I, I kind of want to... Uh, I, I, I would like to... I think it would be fun to teach because I think it would be fun to... Um, because with, with the nice thing about I squared C and Spy too, but like you are getting much closer to kind of the atomic particles of computing. Of course, it's all analog, which is the other thing that's really terrible. Is that like just when you think it's like you're really getting to like the foundation, you realize the foundation's not there at all, and you fall through the floor. But well, and like I squared C is also slow enough that like you can put a really cheap oscilloscope on it yes. and figure out what you've messed up. Um, and doing that on like 100 megahertz QSPY as you're booting an FPGA is not uh, not not exactly the most human interfaceable, although certainly um, something that we've had to do over the years. Uh, it sounds like you were with us at Bring Up last week, where we are one of the first things we do is drop down a, a bit stream to an FPGA or, and over SPY. And yeah, that was definitely more of an adventure than I squared C for sure. Um, Oh, hopefully that worked well for you. I did actually. Uh, <laughs> you made it, yeah. So yeah, honestly, yeah. God bless the Ice Forty and Claire Wolf, who reverse engineered the Ice Forty. Um, the Open FPGA ecosystem is great. So yeah, where did the, we've got a. Oh, so, so so you guys are all Open FPGA Ice Forty. Uh, uh, yep. Um, the okay. um, we are. I, uh, even though Lattice is a little bit like, I don't think we try to explain to Lattice why this is so important. They kind of don't get it, but yes, we are. Um, I have, I have also tried to explain to Lattice why this is so important and they've maybe listened a little bit more perks of not being such an open company. Um, but like, yeah, I'm not sure they're going to do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. And just to tease that a little bit. So we actually did, we, the open source firmware conference, uh, Tom, you remember that, that we were, that, that was like one of the, I think that, Tom, that is the last conference I was physically at was the open source firmware conference with you in 2019, uh, 2019, 20, yeah, I mean, yeah, 2019. Um, yeah, 2019. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, the open source firmware conference is coming up at the end of November, um, and we will be open sourcing our operating system before we're going to have a talk on that at the open source firmware conference, and we'll be open sourcing Hubris before then. Um, so you get a chance to see everything we're doing, including the, the blue spec and everything else that we're actually um, dropping down onto that FPGA. What did I think? Well, using that as what, your BMC, I assume? Yeah, that's, so we don't have a BMC. We've got a service processor, but yeah, that's our for well, we're yeah. running Hubris on our our service processor, and that FPGA is the actual the sequencer, the actual um, the the power sequencer. Because you can't just turn things on. I mean, I know that for those of you who are who have I, who have not had to deal with the innards of hardware, uh, stuff that's powered off is actually in a, in in a somewhat undefined state if you've got power on the board. So uh, it's actually uh, it's actually very challenging to power things on. Um, 
anyway, you know. So yes, we're gonna be. And what do you mean? <laughs> my first one of my first embedded projects was soldering a transistor across the power button for my laptop and turned it into a server that I could remotely <laughs> turn on because I had a <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so we'll have a lot more to say about that. And yeah, maybe we should do, we should maybe do a, a Twitter space on... What, on what is up. the i40? It, what is the i40? Yes. Uh, the i40 is an FPGA um, that is now... Um, made by by Lattice, um, and the Ice Forty is interesting because it was reverse engineered by Claire Wolf, um, and she figured out the bitstream format. And then there are uh, a bunch of open source tools that can generate bitstreams for it. So the bitstream is what you download onto the FPGA that tells it what to do. Um, and most for Xilinx and for the, for the other um, for Altera and so on, um, they are generally proprietary. So you have to use their tooling. Um, and there are, I am both, I, on the one hand, I, I disagree with proprietary software for lots of reasons, but I also really don't like bad software and the software generally has uh, lots of challenges associated with it. So um, FPGA, open FPGAs, the, the ICE 40s um, have been, have been huge for us. Yeah, I was, I was wondering for Can a you while. Deploy? I was wondering for a while how you guys were going to manage to intersect openness with FPGA and there you go. You know, there you go. Yep. Can you deploy bit streams from Hubris to the yeah, FPGA? We, we, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. So we've got the, the bit stream is effectively the bit mm -hmm. stream for the sequencer is in the image. So when that thing, uh, it's a bit of an open question. What is the actual first instruction to be executed? Um, because there are, uh, even in our system, there are still instructions that we can't see on some of these individual components. Um, like the, the IBC for sure has instructions that we can't see. But the SP is the first thing that executes instructions that we can see. It downloads a, uh, um, a bit stream that contains the, uh, the, the sequencer for the FPGA, and then it begins to talk to the FPGA. And the uh, the bug that we had that I'm alluding to is that when that FPGA was tri-stated, uh, the SP could see its I squared C buses, and then when the FPGA powered on, all of a sudden the SP could not see two of its I squared C buses because what had actually happened is that we were now not giving power to a level translator that was giving us absolute bonkers stuff to the SP. So. <laughs> It was, it did, and, and then we were, the, you know, tales of bring up, uh, the, we were, uh, that, that was made much more difficult to debug because we only saw that on one board. Two boards didn't see that. And when you're in a bring up lab where every board is unfortunately a little bit different, every board has got a different level of rework associated with it. When one board sees something that the other two boards don't see, your first thought is, no, oh, I'm seeing parasitic capacitance and, you know, I've got a level translator that's misbehaving or what have you. you your first thought is, like, one, the, the rework has done some – somehow the rework has damaged this board in such a way that this FPGA is interfering with an I2C bus that it's not on. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was that – was, uh, felt like 20 hours, but it was only about two and a half hours of total confusion about what was going on. So Matt, how's that for a uh, a summary from the Bring Up Lab? Yeah, sounds good. We're uh, I'm glad to know that you guys are uh, you know go everything's going well and you know best of luck for all your rest of your Bring Up. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're we're, we're getting there. We're having fun. Um, and the good news is that all the components, um, everything at this point has has powered up. We've got power. We've got we've used the the tooling to verify that the rails are up properly. So we're getting there. And, and you guys. You guys have sockets now, or uh, we have some... nobody's quite brave enough to put that in. The, 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 that's next. So that's where we're, the, the time to actually. Um, the, uh, AMD makes actually a great tool um, that allows you to do a lot of. Uh, you can do all of your power verification before actually. The reason you want to be hesitant on a socket is because you actually blow apart. Um, and so we are, that's basically where we are right now is, is advancing to that stage because we believe we're not going to start throwing out dead CPUs, which is important. Can, can I just say how jealous I am of like everyone over on the CPU side and the x86 side where you all have sockets, unlike on the programmable logic side where you just have to put power into a $20,000 chip and cross your fingers? Oh, 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 oh. 
<laughs> like okay so if you <laughs> we should do i i, I know we're, we've run way long now so we should wrap it up but i we should do matt we should I, I think we need to do a twitter space on tales from the bring up lab because i would love to hear some of those stories of i'm sure you've got some stories of uh and there was a moment where I thought the engineer next to me had just blown the board and he thought he, everyone around him thought we just blown the board. Uh, but also, uh, and just, he was so calm about just like, just reaching over for his meter and beginning to check his, as it turns out, like the thing had, he had not blown it at all. It had just, uh, it had done what it should do. Um, and we were, uh, we were able to, the board was fine, but I was crapping my pants. Um, and the, uh, you know, cause you can, you can actually like damage stuff, which, um, you know, I, I, I definitely, if there's something to damage, I've damaged it. So, um, this is why I don't touch these <laughs> things. But, yeah, I know that the, uh, Adam is laughing at the many mishaps that he is, I'm sure thinking of over the years that I've. That, that's, that could be an episode. That could be a, all right. All right. We got a, we got a bunch for the future then. All right, but on that note, um, Adam, any any final what thoughts? Are, yeah. What are your opinions about Askel? About what? Askel, the programming la- language. A- Askel. Oh, Haskell. You know that's funny. You the uh yeah, Haskell hasn't really come up. Um, I uh honor Haskell for its focus on novelty because I'm glad that someone's got that focus. I, it's not a language for me personally, but I think a lot of what I like about Rust has some origins in Haskell, so I'm pro Haskell in that regard. Adam, have you done Haskell? Never, but uh, it, it's uh, on the list. And I, and I just wanted to get in here before we wrap it up that I really like your approach to finding these topics, Brian, which is to tweet a bunch of stuff for the week and whatever, whatever hits that's the thing we talk about and I think it's kind of genius uh, yeah you're assuming there's a method to the madness but yeah at, at least there's some madness <laughs> there's some there's there's madness yeah. alright on that note thanks everybody see you next time thanks everyone